Affairs and Related Agencies Subcommittee will come to order. Thank you all for participating in this hearing about the Army Quality of Life and Installations Update. Before we begin, as this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. I do think someone is not on mute though. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules. Beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. And now the subcommittee will come to order. Good morning. Nope, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. Today, we welcome the Army installation staff and senior enlisted to discuss quality of life issues, as well as to give us an update on installations. We have before us Mr. J.E. Jack Sirach, Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. Lieutenant General Jason T. Evans, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army for Installations Management. Sergeant Major Michael A. Grinston, Sergeant Major of the Army. Thank you all for joining us today to testify about some very critical issues. I, I know we have a lot to discuss. Today, we look forward to engaging with the Army on a host of important subject, subjects. However, as I have said in the two other service hearings, before we can dive into the critical issues impacting our Army, it's important that we preface the hearing by highlighting a major overarching obstacle facing the readiness and success of our armed forces, which is the perennial scaling down of MILCON funding. Over the last several years, we've seen a troubling pattern of decreases in military construction funding, a trend that not only impacts the mission readiness of our forces, but also the quality of life of service members and their families. Between FY20 and FY21, the Army saw a reduction of $690 million in the President's budget request for military construction funding. This constitutes an incredible and frankly unacceptable decrease of roughly 30%. Military construction is not simply the building of military bases and installations, it's providing ch quality childcare. It's ensuring security for our service members and their families. It's supporting our allies. It is deterring our adversaries. It is establishing schools. It is modernizing hospitals and fire stations. It's giving those who serve our country good homes to live in. The very least we can do for our men and women in uniform is provide them with the peace of mind that comes from knowing their families are safe and cared for while they are on deployment. Although we don't yet have the FY22 President's Budget Request, I'm hopeful that it will reflect a renewed commitment to prioritizing the funding of military construction projects that ensure the success of our military and those families that sacrifice so much for our country. Even without the FY22 budget, this hearing and the answers we'll seek within it will demonstrate how the current fiscal year's funds are being put to use and paint a picture of what is needed for the next fiscal year. For example, this hearing will discuss the $3.6 billion of stolen MILCON funds by the Trump administration for a whimsical border wall and what impacts the deferred projects have had on our forces. We'll also inquire as to how much funding will be returned from this now canceled wall, and if it will be enough to restore the deferred projects. We'll look for explanations as to why privatized housing continues to struggle with oversight and quality assurance issues, and why the Tenant Bill of Rights still has not been fully implemented two years after it was passed into law. Today, we'll focus on women in the Army and how they face impossible testing odds and ongoing bias. This hearing will address the ongoing sexual assault crisis facing our services, particularly the Army, and expect the witnesses to explain the newest approaches to ensuring every member of our military is heard and protected. Additionally, I know I'm joined with my colleagues in hoping to receive a full report on how the Army is working to expand and improve child development centers at our many installations. In FY21, this subcommittee provided $174 million for three Army CDCs, and we look forward to hearing a progress report on those. CDCs are integral to mission readiness, and while there has been a surge of support for more CDCs, the Army still has issues with several facility conditions. Amongst those other issues we'll look to engage on today 
will include what the Army is doing to ensure installation preparedness for climate change, how the services are updating their archaic practices around incorporating women into the force, and what the Army is doing to remediate PFAS contamination. As you can see, we have many important issues discussed. I believe this hearing is a great opportunity to identify those crucial areas where we can do more to serve those who serve us. And now I'd like to recognize Judge Carter for his opening remarks. Judge? Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, my, my, my voice is a little bit better. I'll try to do as best I can. Uh, you've saved the best for last, in my opinion. Go Army. So I can tell you I am recovering. I will get better. I look forward to our discussion today. I yield back. Good, good call, Judge. Preserve that voice. <laughs> we uh, we look forward to to hearing your your melodic your melodic voice uh, for many years into into the future. Let's um, hope so. <laughs> so uh, th thank you so much, and I want to uh, thank each of you for taking the time to be here and sharing your perspectives and expertise. Without objection, all written statements will be entered into the record. Due to the number of witnesses, we will move down the list as follows. Jack, Jack Sirach, Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installation of Energy and Environment. Lieutenant General Jason T. Evans, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army for Installations Management. And Sergeant Major, Major Michael A. Grinston, Sergeant Major of the Army. Your full written testimony will be entered into the record and you'll be recognized for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Uh, Secretary Sirach, you're up first. You're recognized for five minutes to summarize your opening statement, and your full written testimony will be entered into the record without objection. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the soldiers, families, and civilians of the United States Army, thank you for the opportunity to discuss how the Army is preparing for the challenges ahead by addressing quality of life initiatives such as privatized housing, barracks, and child care, while working to increase the climate resilience of infrastructure. I am joined today by Lieutenant General Evans and Sergeant Major of the Army Grinston. Our progress has been guided by the Army Installation Strategy, the Army People Strategy, and the Army Modernization Strategy. Together, these strategies focus our effects on taking care of people, strengthening readiness and resilience, modernizing and innovating, and promoting sound stewardship. As you know, housing has been a key focus area. Our soldiers and their families deserve high quality, safe housing. Our focus is on fixing the privatized housing issues brought to light in 2018. At the same time, we're working with the privatized companies to sustain the long-term financial health of our housing portfolio. I believe we continue to make progress. The Army has fully implemented 14 of 18 tenant rights at, at 44 installations. We continue to push to meet the uh, June 1 goal to fully implement the remaining uh, for Tenant Bill of Rights. We are reviewing and approving all universal leases before implementation and are working very closely with the privatized housing companies to make the new leases available at all installations as close to June 1 as possible. The privatized housing companies are spending $1.5 billion and reinvesting another $1.3 billion for housing improvements over the next five years. We also continue to invest in our Army-owned inventory. In regards to barracks, the Army has invested $2.1 billion for construction, restoration, and modernization over the last three years. The Army is focused on modernizing barrack standards that incorporate user feedback and the latest technologies. The Army will continue to work to increase the overall quality of Army-owned and privatized housing and barracks. All of this is occurring while the Army is striving to maintain and increase the resilience of our installation infrastructure. Energy and water resilience, or uninterrupted access to energy and water, are essential for Army readiness and ensuring the total Army can deploy, fight, and win. Climate change is a direct threat to our Army. To combat that threat, the Army is proactively taking steps to address the impacts and causes of climate change and extreme weather. Army readiness begins on our installations. Through adaption, mitigation, and innovation, the Army will work to secure the readiness and resilience of forces, functions, and facilities. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your continued support of our soldiers, families, and Army civilians. Thank you, Secretary Sirach. Uh, he yields back. Uh, now I'd like to recognize General Evans, 
You recognize for five minutes to summarize your opening statement and your opening statement will be entered into the record without objection. Thank you, Chairwoman Wasman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of over 1 million soldiers and 2.2 million family members, thank you for your continued support of our Army. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the importance of the Army's quality of life and military construction initiatives. During November 2019, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army tasked my organization to lead the Army's Quality of Life Task Force. The Quality of Life Task Force developed a campaign plan consisting of six lines of efforts focusing on improving housing and barracks, providing premier health care, accessible child care, opportunities for spouse employment, improving permanent change of station moves, and providing support and resilience to soldiers and families at installations with critical quality of life needs like Forts Wainwright, Irwin, Polk, and Hood. The Quality of Life Task Force lines of effort are nested with the Army's recently published installation strategy. While this strategy's primary purpose is to describe how installations will transform by 2035 into multi-domain platforms that protect, support, and enable the total Army, it will also help guide our infrastructure investments in support of our Army priorities. We continue to hold ourselves and the RCI partners accountable for ensuring soldiers and their families are living in safe and quality housing. Last year, your committee accelerated funding for three child development centers so we could continue to address our on-post child care capacity sooner. And we truly appreciate your committee's support. We're also taking immediate steps to expand family child care homes on post and provide fee assistance to help in locations where families need off-post care options. We plan to exercise Congress's new pilot program to authorize additional child development center construction on military installations. Under this program, we hope to parlay bid savings to build a CDC at Fort Gordon years earlier than would be possible through normal MILCON programming. We look forward to working with your committee to make this a viable solution for future construction needs. We are planning to construct 21 child development centers over the next 10 years, which will add approximately 4,000 new child care spaces. With your continued support in providing timely, adequate, sustainable, and predictable funding, our installations will remain ready and resilient and provide the quality of life that our soldiers and families deserve. Again, thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. We appreciate your testimony. Sergeant Major Michael Grinston, you're recognized for five minutes to summarize your opening statement, and your opening statement will be entered into the record without objection. Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, distinguished members of the committee, I want to thank you all for the work you have done to support your Army. Your dedication is truly appreciated. In the past year, we've seen it all. A global pandemic, unprecedented civil unrest, the most hurricanes hit the continental U.S. in more than 100 years. In August, one side of the country was on fire while the other side of the country was flooded. We brought thousands to the Capitol to provide security for our democracy, all while operating in a COVID-restricted environment and sustaining combat operations and forward deployments. Our nation has been through a lot this year, and your Army has been there in support. From COVID to the Capitol, this has been a total Army effort. I would like to give a special thanks to our Army National Guard and our United States Army Reserve soldiers who have been especially vital to our success this last year. Your Army was ready because the people make up the greatest force the world has ever known. Our priorities are people, readiness, and modernization. As the Sergeant Major of the Army, I'm focused on all three as we develop leaders who build cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and mentally and physically fit through a framework called, this is my squad. This isn't accomplished through policy alone. Policy without leadership is hollow. Over the past year, we've developed new initiatives to select the best leaders and laid the groundwork for a culture that prepares our soldiers and families for any future operating environment. It begins with our junior soldiers who will soon be required to demonstrate proficiency in warrior task and battle drills before becoming non-commissioned officers. 
at promotion boards to sergeant and staff sergeant, we've added the requirement to answer questions about their soldiers and ask how they would handle scenarios involving behavioral health, finances, and sexual harassment. In professional military education, at every level, we've introduced Project Athena, a self-assessment tool that gives a soldier feedback on their leadership tendencies and tools to improve. As a master sergeant, the assessment becomes binding and will be used to determine which soldiers are selected to become first sergeants. Those assessments have already been piloted at Fort Bragg and Fort Riley, with Fort Drum happening later this summer. Finally, we're using command assessment program to also select command sergeants major starting this year. We're doubling down on our leaders to ensure that we place the right people in the right positions. These efforts help our leaders build an army culture where soldiers are ready to train, deploy, fight, win, and return home. An army culture where we don't fight an enemy inside our formations. A culture where instead just responding to sexual assault and harassment, acts of racism and extremism and death by suicide, we can prevent them from happening. The Army must have world-class trauma-informed response, but I want a culture and prevention efforts to be so strong and effective that we use it less. Leaders who build cohesive teams that are highly trained Discipline and mentally and physically fit are how we get there. Thank you again for your support to your Army, and I look forward to your questions. I yield back. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I appreciate your service uh, and, your, and your testimony, and thank you all. We'll now begin questioning under our normal rules. We'll proceed in the standard five-minute rounds, alternating sides. Recognizing members in order of seniority as they were seated at the beginning of the hearing. Um, and I recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Okay. Um, I, I want to start by talking about women in the Army, which I uh, alluded to in my opening statement. Women in the Army have continually struggled with the new Army's combat fitness test, the ACFT. Nearly half of female soldiers seem to be falling short. Figures from April show 44% of women failed the ACFT compared to just 7% of men. There's concern that the difficulty of the test will impact female recruitment and retention. Sergeant Major Grinston, why is the AS ACFT so difficult for women to pass, but not so difficult for men comparatively? And, and does this new test indicate that the Army doesn't find half of women fit to serve? What is being done in the Army to ensure female recruitment and retention? Madam Chairwoman, uh, thank you uh, for your question. Um, to answer the first part is what are we, or the second part, what are we doing to ensure that our, our women are, are capable of passing uh, the test? Um, we could look at our holistic health and fitness program where we've added athletic trainers and strength coaches um, to each brigade. And this will include in this fiscal year, the Army National Guard, where they have a program to come back and report to us of what they're doing to add these athletic trainers and strength coaches. Okay, so, but I'm sorry if I can just interrupt you for a moment, because I really prefer that you answer my the, the first part of my question first, which is, why is this test seemingly so much more difficult for women to pass than for men? It doesn't make sense that uh, that it would be that imbalanced. Yes, ma'am. Um, this test was not designed um, to say where all folks can pass the test. The, the original charter of the test was asked to look at what tasks are done in combat for both men and women. So when we, we did the charter, we did the warrior task and battle drills and looked at what tasks would be accomplished in combat. The second independent review, which is ongoing right now, would say, what are the challenges for integrating with cold weather climates, doctors, uh, nurses, and women to look at, does the test disadvantage one group? The goal of the Army Combat Fitness Test is to make us more fit for the task that we are performing in combat. 
not to say that our women haven't performed admirably in the past in combat, because they have, but we have to do better. We have to make sure that all our soldiers are fit for combat. So we are adding those strength trainers to make sure uh, we can give everybody the opportunity to get better in physical fitness. Our goal is not to disadvantage any group in the Army combat fitness test. We okay. have to look at those tasks and ensure that those tasks mirror what we do in combat. Uh, okay, well, I mean, the problem seems to continue for women who do pass the test and graduate on into the Army. Uh, it doesn't seem to get easier most of the time. 40% of women in Army Special Operations said they faced gender bias in the workplace. That's according to an initial report of a survey put together by Army SOCOM. Women serving in special ops roles reported issues with ill-fitting equipment, pressure from their units to return from parental leave early, and gender bias in the workplace in an internal survey. Um, I'd really like to know, Sergeant Major, what excuse the Army has for not supplying equipment made to fit women? And what is the Army doing to ensure women don't face gender bias from the ACFT all, all the way to taking parental leave? I, I mean, I just find your answer insufficient. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me that there would be that big a, that, that, the, that the ability for women to pass the test would be so, so the gulf would be so, so wide. And then continuing on into the Army that there are, you know, many, many di difficult situations that women face that the Army seems unwilling uh, or unable to fix. Uh, Madam Chair, one, thank you for that question. Um, the gender, the equipment piece, uh, which you asked uh, first, we, we do have, uh, we've implemented smaller sizes for the body armor for the family of integrated outer tactical vests. We actually have new uh, smaller sizes to fit our women. We actually have um, specially designed uh, combat uniforms uh, for our women. Mm -hmm. And as as we've seen, we have to get these items made and, and out to our women in the service. But it's not uh, just about, being a woman is not just being about the, your equipment being smaller. It's about the equipment being designed to fit a woman physically, not just a smaller size. Yes, ma'am. And that's if I put on my husband's. If I if I if I got a smaller version of my my husband's shirt, that that's not going to be one that was designed to fit my body. So why aren't you designing equipment that fits a woman's body? You have women serving in the same roles as men. Yes, ma'am. We are designing equipment. Uh, for women. We have designed uh, the female combat uniform is designed specifically. There is a woman designed army uh, combat uniform for women. And we are designing uh, combat uniforms to include not just a smaller size uh, for the outer tactical vest. Yes, what about the special operations? Madam Chair, I didn't hear the last part. And what about for special operations? They have ill-fitting equipment and it, it does not appear to be designed to fit women. Madam Chairwoman, when we design the equipment, normally it starts with our special operations and then that usually goes to the conventional force. When we design the, the combat uniform that is designed for all our soldiers and it is not just for conventional versus special operations. Right, except that you have women, people who are in, who are special operations, and men, and equipment would seem to need to be designed to fit both body types. Why isn't it, Madam Chairwoman? We are designing uh, uniforms and combat equipment for women, but not for special operations. Ma'am, the, the equipment, when we design it, um, like I said previously, isn't always designed specifically for special operations or conventional. Normally it works the other way around is that 
when we get a piece of equipment, it would not be only available for conventional or special operations. That equipment would be available for both conventional forces and special operations. Okay, Sergeant Major, women are telling us that the equipment doesn't fit. And so there's a problem. And this is not just an, you know, a one-off problem. It's a problem that has been repeated to the Army and to, to those that oversee your funding. So if you could go back and check to see what kind of follow-up there has been to those complaints and remedy them, that would be helpful. Madam Chair, absolutely. Okay, and if you could get back to us, that would be great. Thank you, I, I yield back. I appreciate uh, Judge Carter's indulgence. You're recognized for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, we got the budget request. It's be released later this week or early next week. Judge, I think we're going to review it. Can you hear me? No, your your connection was choppy. Do you want to try again? Uh, can you hear me now? Now we can. Okay. Well, that must have been. Anyway, we got the budget coming up. Uh, can the army give us any insights on it? Uh, the, what uh, is the Army's construction strategy for FY22? Well, the budget's focused on the nine priority installations, including Fort Hood, Fort Bragg, and Fort Irwin. How many new child development centers in this budget? Did y'all get that? No, Judge, you your your connection is a little bit choppy. So some of your some of your questions came through. But not the well, let's start with how many child development uh, centers you're going to build this year. This, can you hear that? Yeah, if you or, all can, if you all can answer, Judge. Maybe because I'm moving. In, I'm in a move. We heard I'm that in a one. moving vehicle. We heard that one, Judge. Okay. His, 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 at least this part of the question is, how many child development centers do you expect to have in the request this year and build this year? Um, Judge, first of all, the, the, two, the three that the, the committee approved early last year, the two in Hawaii and, and the one in Alaska, uh, we're planning uh, in, for the budget purposes to looking at at least uh, two more and then um, several R and M projects to at least uh, expand uh, capacity. Okay, um, you still are doing the focus on the nine priority installations, Fort Hood being one of them. Yes, sir. Absolutely, uh, Fort Hood is is a focus. Um, of our priority. I, I believe you also asked uh, about uh, facilities in general for Fort Hood. Is, is that correct, Judge? Yes. So um, we are focused uh, um, on Fort Hood um, over the next 10 years. Um, we've got several projects for motor pools. I know motor pools was a big concern, um, as well as tactical equipment maintenance facilities, um, where we, if we have more than four bays, we can put in the 35 ton foot crane or the 10 foot crane so that we don't have soldiers out in the elements. Um, we also, for, for the first time in probably a, a decade, we're revising the Army standards and standard designs for uh, several of the motor pools, the tactical equipment maintenance facilities to bring them up to date um, to code and expand space and the workability and the, and the work areas, as well as the admin areas. Uh, very good. Uh, General Evans, uh, testimony mentions the Army is developing installation investment strategy. When will it be released? And what is its focus? And tell us more about it. Sir, I think, believe you're referring to the facility investment strategy. Uh, Correct. With, yes, sir. 
which is a, a, a document that uh, AMCCOM has for COMPO 1, and it's a living document and it continues to be worked. Um, what I can do, Judge, is go back and see if um, I can't get a copy for the committee. Uh, I don't. I know that it's a working document now, so I don't know for sure if it's it's released uh, for publication. Um, but I can go back and uh, uh, speak with AMC and see if we can't get a copy for the committee to see. Okay, thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yield back. I can't hear her. Thank you, Judge Carter. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Bishop, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Secretary Sirach, uh, General Evans, and Sergeant Major Glenston are welcome. And let me first uh, thank you for your service to our nation and your service to our soldiers and their families. Uh, as the current co-chair of the Congressional Military Family Caucus, uh, military housing for families is a, very, is a top priority. And uh, we know that the housing crisis isn't just going to fix itself overnight. And our service members and their families are going to want to ensure that uh, this issue remains uh, a high priority. Uh, as you are aware, Fort Benning, Georgia, is uh, dear to me. And of course, it's been heavily documented for the lead paint based issues uh, for military housing. Uh, Fort Benning has over 4,000 family housing units in 10 different communities. And because of ongoing renovations and high occupancy, many of the soldiers and their families have to wait six uh, or more months in order to move into base housing. Six months is a pretty long time to have to wait. Uh, how are you addressing the long wait times and when do you expect them to be uh, shortened? And can you give us an update of the ongoing work that's being done to resolve these issues both at Fort Benning and at the other uh, military installations, Army installations? Thresh, um, I'll go first. Um, sir, we are, are laser focused on the, the privatized housing issue. Uh, this uh, uh, came to light, uh, as you're well aware, in, in, uh, in late 2018. And uh, the sorts of things we've done is we've got, I, I believe now, uh, the, the chain of command in the, in the Army totally uh, focused um, you know, on, on this issue to ensure things go go in the proper direction. Everything that I can see, I think it is improving um, over time. Um, so uh, with your help, we've been able to add uh, staffing uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, ensure this proper follow-up with the privatized uh, companies. Uh, the the uh, commanding general at uh, the Army Material Command has, uh, we've delegated authority for the incentive fee program to him. He has uh, um, reviewed um, and uh, kind of standardized the way uh, that that uh, incentive fee is done done across the entire army. Um, another example is um, ever at at change of occupancy and in any service call that is uh, life safety or health, there's a hundred percent inspection uh, by an army person to ensure uh, those sorts of things are remedied. And sir, the last thing I would say is the uh, the privatized companies have uh, uh, are are. Uh, uh, borrowing funds, so there's a, there's about 1.3 uh, billion uh, borrowed, and another billion that's going to come from future uh, you know future investments. So we're so the, we're really pushing the companies to talk to, to me up. about the dam. Tell tell me uh, how long is it going to take, and what should we expect in terms of a timeline to have these backlogs uh, uh, resolved? Um. I would say uh, we should see steady improvement, uh, but it's going to probably take, uh, a, a, I'd say, a year, uh, maybe a year or two across the entire inventory to see uh, marked improvements, but we're moving just as fast as we can, sir. All right. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, Sergeant Major Grinston, do you have anything that you can add with respect to uh, Fort Benning? and uh, the lead paint uh, issue? Yes, um, thank you for the question. And I, I will add on the um, a little bit about the wait times. Um, it's important to note that 
I don't know the exact number, about 70% of all military families live off the installation. So um, the reason that's important with the wait times is we actually do want soldiers and families to be on our installations, but because we don't have 100% of all family housing on every installation, those wait times, depending on where people are, and where they come in because only 30% of almost all installations only live on the, the base. So 70% have to live off the installation. And then that's a choice to move on. So those wait times will go up and down consistently. As less lead base, um, we have to do better for our families on lead base uh, housing. We've looked at those predated, I think it's 1970-ish and ensured that uh, we have lead-based uh, reductions. Uh, the, uh, but what we're doing even more importantly, we've added 114 additional inspectors for quality insurance. So as every house and every family moves out, that those inspectors that we've added, and we appreciate the support in uh, getting those folks hired, that they will go do and do a quality insure, insurance so to ensure that the lead-based painting has been mitigated at every Army installation so those homes are ready to be moved in. Thank you, uh, uh, Sergeant Major. Uh, the chair has stepped out and she has asked me to uh, assume the chair in her absence. <laughs> so uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Valadeo for uh, his questions. Uh, Mr. Valade, Lo, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And uh, to our uh, witnesses, thank you for your testimony today and your time. Um, I just want to start off with a, a question directed at uh, Master Sergeant Griston. Uh, I know that mental health awareness and suicide prevention, uh, uh, prevention within the military is a top concern for everyone here. And I'm glad you addressed it today in your testimony. Have you had difficulty competing with the private sector and retaining enough qualified mental health care providers to meet the Army's demands? If so, are there any concerns of uh, courses of action uh, you have identified to help with hiring and retention? Uh, yes. I think the, the nation is struggling with getting enough behavioral health uh, professionals and not just uh, in and around in our communities it's just as a nation we need to do better um and, and what are we doing what can we see to mitigate those risks i, I really we uh COVID actually helped i believe and uh, it didn't you know help us all completely but what i'm saying is it enabled us to do teleworking or telehealth and that i believe that is one of the things we've seen as we could figure out how to get continuity of care through telehealth. We've seen our telehealth and behavioral health increase. And that's one of the, the initiatives that we have seen that has worked to help with our behavioral health specialists, especially in those remote and isolated locations where it's difficult to get behavioral health specialists hired in those areas because they wanna go to larger populated areas. We have seen the growth of telehealth. That's one of our initiatives to see how we can get telehealth out more and use it frequently. That will help in remote and isolated locations and also help with continuity of care. I appreciate that. And a person that represents a large rural district, I completely understand uh, uh, being isolated, not being able to, to get good quality folks to an area. Uh, so I want to kind of go down the same path. Uh, I understand that mental health care continues to be a sensitive topic for some service members who are concerned that getting help could have a negative impact on their career. Can you go into a little more detail on the steps you have taken to address this stigma? Congressman, uh, thank you for that question. Um, what we've done is I've actually come out and publicly and asked uh, the whole Army to look at it a little differently in how we approach mental health. When I hurt my knee or my leg or I'm not feeling right, I, I have no reservation about going to the doctor or going to a physical therapist. So I have communicated to the entire force that we should have no reservations in our soldiers seeking behavioral health. Um, it is still uh, 
the stigma is is still a widely known stigma, but we have to break through that culture. One of the pilots we've initiated at, at Fort Raleigh was that every year we'd have an annual checkup so that it's not, it's just how we go. We do uh, a annual checkup, but just make sure all my systems are good. We also need to do an annual checkup on our mental health to ensure that we're going in the right direction, both mentally and physically. All right, well, I appreciate that. So the Army has agreed to review the charges of thousands of veterans affected by post-traumatic uh, post uh, stress disorder, uh, traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, or other behavioral health conditions, and to change some of its administrative policy uh, procedures for individuals who are discharged with less than fully honorable service characterizations while having a diagnosis of or showing symptoms of uh, the conditions listed above. How many cases have you reviewed? And can you give me an update uh, to some of the administrative changes being made? I have to take that for the record. I'm not sure the the exact number of cases. We'd, we'd have to get back to you on that answer. All right, well, I appreciate that. And uh, yes, I would like to have that uh, for the record and uh, would like to get an answer back from you as quickly as possible. Uh, the rest of my question will take a little bit more time, so I'll yield back the remainder of my time and I'll wait for my next round. So thank you again, and uh, I, I yield back, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Valadeo. Uh, at this time, I'm delighted to recognize uh, uh, Mr. Ed Case. Uh, Mr. Case, you are now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether this is for Mr. Sirach or, or General Evans. Your, your testimony, your joint testimony, made a very brief reference to um, um, funding the facilities, sustainment, restoration, and modernization of Army installations, the FSRM, but you gave no real details. That was a very, very quick uh, paragraph there, and this seems to me to be a huge area, so, so let's, let's dig in there. What, last week, we had, a, we had a, um, um, a, a comparable hearing with the Air Force. They estimated their SFRM backlog at $30 billion, um, obviously of great concern. Um, what is your estimate of Army FSRM backlog? Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll start, but then I'll, I'll ask for uh, General Evans to, to possibly uh, assist. Um, so uh, we have a, a, uh, a large uh, um, backlog of, uh, you know, of, of work to do. This has uh, uh, been caused by a, a uh, uh, just not uh, uh, being able to to invest uh, over over the course of time, and uh, so we've we have we've got to focus on that, and we're we're working hard uh, to to uh, to reinvest that or to to, uh, to arrest arrest that and 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 move things uh, you know properly uh, going forward. General, I'm I'm interested in the number. What is your estimated estimated dollar number for your SFR, FSRM, similar to what the Air Force did at $30 billion. Uh, Congressman, um, I know ours is in excess of that. I would, I would take that question for the record to get you the specific number, because um, I, I don't want to speculate. Do you, have a, do you have a range? I mean, you said it's more than $30 billion. I mean, is it more than $100 billion? Uh, uh, I think, uh, I think Congressman, we're somewhere between uh, um, closer to maybe $60 billion, maybe. Okay. And, and, to the, and to the chair's point in her opening statement as to, as to underfunding the, the MILCON budget overall, I mean, is there, a, uh, is there a, a match of your funding requests to a uh, backlog of S FSRM of that very, very large scale? Are you are you ramping up to get at the S FSRM, or do you feel you're you're being you know shortchanged on on getting at that kind of backlog? Okay. Let, me, let me try first, Congressman, and then and General Evans could could uh, could could help me. So, um, uh, what 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 you will see in in our uh, our soon to be re, uh, released budget is uh, is ability to to uh, to cover our our most uh, critical uh, requirements. We are making an attempt to. Uh, uh, to uh, um, go after uh, you know our backlog, uh, but this has been this has just been caused by underfunding over over a you know a, a long a long period of time. And it's going to take it's going to take some time to uh, to attempt to get caught up, sir. So I okay. I would, oh. So I would 
So I would tell you that um, to answer your question, yes, recognizing the backlog, uh, we're focused on uh, around the Army priorities, which is uh, people, uh, readiness, and modernization. And, and as such, specifically the people, quality, quality of life, um, we're, we're focused in on CDCs, um, housing, uh, barracks, uh, and those types of things. And uh, to, to the judge's point uh, about maintenance facilities, when you're talking about readiness and motor pools. So the, the facility investment plan um, that um, the judge spoke of does look at that and tries to prioritize those uh, in accordance with the current Army priorities, sir. Okay, well, I, I have no problem at all with your investment in people and your investment in CDCs and, and really in new facilities that are, that are responsive to the to the Army's needs at the times, but um, a 60 billion or so understood that's an estimate. Backlog in basic facilities maintenance is pretty scary in all honesty. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what the budget has to say about that. Um, and you quickly, uh, I won't have time to get your full answer, but uh, we also had a discussion um, in, the, in some of the other services about historic preservation and the Ar Army has made mention of uh, I think you I think you phrased it as a new paradigm um, on historic preservation in terms of the implementation of the National Historic Preservation Act. Have you partnered with state historic preservation offices to actually fund their efforts to administer the National Historic Preservation Act as it as it impacts um, Army facilities? And if you can do that real quickly and then I'll follow up for the record. Um, Congressman, we're working very closely with them. Uh, what you may be referring to as a is a program comment that the Army issued for uh, housing built between 1919 and, and 1940. And, and, and that allows us to, uh, to update, modernize, and demo if necessary um, without the individual consultation, which many times uh, you know, takes a lot of time. So we, we view that as a real success story, a real partnership with the State Historic Preservation Offices, sir. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll follow up later. Appreciate it. I'm Mr. Bishop. Back. Okay, Mr. Bishop, thank you so much for uh, for chairing the, the subcommittee in my absence, and I appreciate it very much. Um, and the gentleman, Mr. Casey, yields back. Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And first, I, I, I want to say thank you to the panel, uh, both for being here this afternoon, but also for your many years of service to uh, to America. We we truly do appreciate uh, all of you. And uh, I I have to send a a special hello to Lieutenant General Evan from uh, Colonel Chris Miller, who's my district director here in in uh, Jacksonville. He said he had an opportunity to serve with you uh, in the D.C. area up there for a time. So hello from Chris and. Um, and and I want to say, you know, in talking about your service, um, you know, Sergeant Major Grinston, um, I really appreciate the, the personal attention uh, that you showed in, in making the rounds uh, on Capitol Hill. And uh, so it, it's uh, a pleasure to see you here today. I have a question. I'd like to start with uh, Assistant Secretary Sirach, if I might. Uh, you know, when we look at the load that the that the National Guard is now taking on, uh, particularly the the Guard here in Florida, uh, they have briefed me on some of their really dire needs concerning military construction, including two security forces, uh, National Guard readiness centers, and a training range. Uh, and, and I know there's a lot, I mean, we just talked about uh, what uh, Lieutenant General 60 billion uh, in, in backlog work. Um, can, Mr. Secretary, can you talk a little bit about how you're going to balance those needs with our guard needs for these facilities that, you know, we, we it's, it, it's a dire situation. Uh, Congressman, I, um, I'll be happy to, uh, to attempt to. Uh, so 
as we as we formulate a, a budget, uh, we're, we're, we work with with the active component, the reserve component, and and the National Guard, and we and we bring the requirements together, and then through the lens of the of the priorities that General Evans um, outlined, um, we 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 more or less stack rack and stack the you know the projects, and that's that's what you will. You will see uh, in the in the upcoming uh, um, president's budget is is our attempt to to uh, to focus on on all three components, and and um, obviously we're going to be attempting to cover the most critical requirements first, sir. Okay, I I, I appreciate that, and, and I look forward to seeing the uh, the milk on uh, part of the budget as it come, as it rolls out. Let let me ask. Uh, uh, how many brigades do we have now? Is it 31? Is that the number? Is that the correct number? Mm -hmm. Army yes. brigade? Yes, sir. 31? Uh, Congressman. Yes. Okay. And, um, and I know some time back, Sergeant Milley, uh, and where I'm going with this is I want to talk about strengthen, uh, strengthening our readiness and resiliency. Uh, I remember Secretary, um, I believe it was Mattis that mentioned, um, you know, well, let me just ask this question. How many of those brigades are ready to fight tonight? Out of the 31. Mr. Uh, thank you for the question. We'd have to take that uh, for the record. I don't, have, as a Sergeant Major of the Army, I um, don't have the exact number of the brigades, the G3 tracks those hourly. Um, and I do, I do wanna make one correction. Those are active uh, guards. There's more um, brigade combat teams when we look at the total army force. So uh, again, I don't, I don't know the exact number of the brigade combat teams that are ready exactly at this morning. Uh, that's a, the G3 tracks those uh, daily. Thank you, Sergeant Major. And, and I, and I, if I remember right, uh, now this was three or four years ago, and, and the number was like five, uh, and that was very disconcerting to me. And and I was curious if we made any headway on that because I know we're certainly attempting to. Uh, and and we'll talk more about the the readiness and resiliency uh, in my next round. I hope. I see my time's run out, Madam Chair. I will yield back. You're on mute, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Trone, you're recognized for your five minutes of questions. Okay, Madam Chair, Chairwoman, thank you. And Frankie member, uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, Fort Detrick uh, is in my district and is home to USAMRID, uh, which conducts, you know, critical biomedical research. Uh, Fort Detrick is the only bio four lab in the entire United States for the Department of Defense. Um, and as the only bio four lab, uh, they do work on Ebola, Zika, COVID, anthrax. All those have been worked on at Fort Detrick. Uh, the post has an on-site incinerator uh, to deal with all of these uh, difficult subjects. Unfortunately, due to some mechanical problems, it had to be shut down uh, late in 2018. Uh, since then, the Army's been transporting uh, these hazardous wastes uh, by truck uh, to near Baltimore to a landfill. Uh, Mr. Sirach, uh, would you agree that... Uh, It'd be preferable if we could get Fort Detrick to have a functional incinerator uh, on site uh, rather than transporting uh, this hazardous waste uh, from Maryland up to uh, through, across Maryland. Mr. Surish, is that a yes? Mr. Surish, we can't right. hear you. Uh, there we go. Uh, Congressman, yes, sir. Absolutely. 
Okay. So we will, we like to work together uh, to ensure Fort Detrick uh, receives the funding uh, they need uh, to fix this incinerator um, at a quickest pace possible uh, rather than just when the military gets to it. Uh, it's a most important base, one of the most important base we have in the country. And the USAMRID facility, uh, we spent $1.2 billion on it now already. And because of uh, some issues uh, with the facility and the safety of the facility, uh, we've not yet been able to get the new facility, which is 800,000 square feet open and running, uh, which is a huge, huge facility and expense. So we appreciate your help on that, and we're going to follow up. Um, similar to other bases, uh, service members living at Fort Detrick in privatized housing have experienced some tough conditions. Uh, we've had mold, insect infestations, appliances broken, uh, slow responses to work orders. Uh, we all agree it's not acceptable for our troops. And what resources do you need uh, so we can help you with, so we can exercise better oversight on privatized housing? Thank you very much for that question, um, sir. Um, uh, at the moment, we frankly don't need any additional resources. We we greatly appreciate the additional funding that the Congress provided that allowed the Army to to hire an additional 114 staff to to oversee the activities of our of our privatized housing companies. Um, there's a a, a range of uh, you know of efforts going on. I think we're starting to see uh, some improvement. But back to the manpower, we do have a manpower study ongoing right now that will complete in the fall, and we'll take we're, what we're taking a look at is our needs at all um, echelons in, in the Army organization. So we may have an updated, uh, uh, some updated uh, requirements uh, in, in the fall, but for the, for the moment, sir, we, we have the resources we need. Thank you. Okay, well, we're gonna, we'll follow up my office if you don't mind on that. And uh, so we can try, this has been a long going battle. Um, the other issue we have is brown water. 10% uh, of the houses in Fort Detrick, and I have 75,000 workers there, uh, it's the largest employer in that part of the district by far. And uh, the water coming out of their pipes is brown, forcing them to buy bottled water. Uh, we'd love to see the Army implement a permanent solution to this uh, versus installing temporary water filters. So we're going to follow up on that. And the other thing we like to follow up on, uh, we're going to send you a letter, and that's a written submission on water into Fort Detrick. Uh, they've, the water plant has been shut down and the Army's decided to rely on the Monocacy River. Unfortunately, the river doesn't always flow that well. And when the river drops below a certain level, uh, there's no water uh, available for drinking water. So we're gonna submit that question in writing and, and we'll follow up on those areas. And really thank you uh, for being here today and helping us out. I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to get right into it. I have quite a few uh, questions. First question is for uh, Sergeant Major Grinston. Uh, the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee provided 70 recommendations to improve the sexual harassment assault response prevention program. What can we ex uh, when can we expect the Army to have implemented all 70 recommendations? Congressman, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the Secretary accepted all 70 recommendations from the Fort Hood Independent Review. Um, the reason I say that is uh, we have to we establish the People First Task Force to, to look at and review all 70 of those recommendations and so far we have implemented 23 of the the 70. some of these are long-term uh, recommendations either we have to get more authorizations for people or facilities so i i can't say this will be done on this date um, because it does take other authorizations but so far we've implemented 23 of the 70 recommendations I appreciate I appreciate that information. I appreciate you not taking that for the record and, and giving us what you have. And uh, I know how, how hard you are working to to get that completed. It's so critical 
uh, that our soldiers, you know, uh, feel safe and and have every every uh, avenue to to be protected on that. If there's anything you need from our end to get you over that line at a faster rate, please keep in mind um, that anything we can do to help, uh, we're here to do that. Uh, next question, Mr. Sarash. Um, construction of a new dining facility for Camp Bullis has been indefinitely delayed. The current dining hall was constructed in the 1930s and lacks adequate air conditioning, has no bathrooms on site, and employees must leave the facility to access food storage units. The soldiers training here do not have the means to dine off base, and there are no other options uh, on Camp Bullis, leaving this facility as their only option. Does the Army plan to request funding for this project as part of the President's budget? Uh, Congressman, I, I apologize. I do not have uh, info uh, um, you know, with me on that. I, I will have to do a follow-up, sir. Please do. I mean, Camp Bullis is, is so critical. It, it is an, a gym uh, that I think could really be utilized by the Army, but we have to spend some resources to update some of the basic things like a dining hall. I mean, 1930s, that's, a, that's, that's just unacceptable. Please let me, once again, let me know if there's anything you need on our end. That's very important to my district. Uh, next question is for uh, Lieutenant General Evans. Periodically, presidential administrations request Fort Bliss and the DOD to assist in addressing influxes of migrants at the southern border by providing shelter and using military assets. Is Fort Bliss getting the support it needs from the administration to fulfill these requests? Uh, sir, thank you for the, the question. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, sir, yes. Uh, follow up. Do you know if there's has there been any negative impact or readiness during this current uh, migrant influx? No, sir. Not to the, not to my knowledge. Good. I visited Fort Bliss uh, before this facility even opened up, and I want to make sure that um, that that doesn't impact readiness at all. You know, we we've, we've got a mission to maintain, and migrants really isn't part of that mission. But um, next question, Mr. Uh, Sarash, as you know, a key component of readiness is adequate housing and infrastructure. Fort Bliss's barracks are in need of renovation and updating. Where does this project land on the Army's MILCON priorities? Uh, sir, I, I do not have that with me. I will follow up, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fort Bliss is, is, a, is a large base and it's only growing. And I want to make sure that it has the infrastructure it needs to be successful. Uh, next question. Mr. Sarash, the Army needs to increase its rapid deployment capability for armored units. The current rail capabilities at Fort Bliss only allow the Army to unload, to load units onto rail cars with one track, which means moving equipment to the Pacific Theater would easily take more than four weeks in the event of a crisis uh, like China invading Taiwan. How does the Army plan to address this vulnerability? Uh, sir, again, if, if I may follow up uh, with you, you, you point out a, a very important item, though, sir. Thank you. I visited that the facility. That rail cart is so critical to uh, to that base, not only now but in the future. I'm out of time, Madam Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, thank you, Ms. Lee. You're recognized for your five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I'd like to thank all the witnesses for testifying today. Uh, Lieutenant General Evans, thank you so much for testifying. And I um, recently spoke with Major General Andre Berry, the Adjutant General here in Nevada, of the Na Nevada National Guard. And uh, one about all the great work of the servicemen and women here. Also, we discussed the National Guard's need for a new weapons range. And as you know, several states, including Nevada, do not have weapons qualification ranges that need, meet the new Army standards. Um, though the new standard obviously is needed, um, I also believe we need to be good stewards of our public lands. And given that over 80% of Nevada is federal land and is home to Nellis Air Force Base, uh, Creech, as well as the Fallon Training Range, I think there might be an opportunity for us to contemplate co-using lands. So could you please uh, elaborate on the process of 
how we would go about entering an agreement with other departments for potential co-use of lands? Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. Um, I don't I don't have the specifics on the, the detailed process to do that. I do know, ma'am, there is a way to um, do that with the other services entering in a memorandum of agreement or some type of official agreement for co-use of land. But I will take that uh, for the for the record and get you the detailed process, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. If if I if I can't, I did I did talk to um, Sergeant Major Spalding, uh, the state CSM, this weekend. Um, to make sure that uh, we also uh, can support him fully in his endeavors to main qualified. As you know, uh, the National Training Center is a three hour drive from Las Vegas, and there should be no issues with using that land for the weapons qualification standards. That's uh, terrific news. And however I can be helpful, I'm here uh, to help. So thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to shift some gears to the holistic uh, health and fitness program. Uh, this program is a much needed resource for today's Army. Um, however, the initial structure was well designed for the active component, uh, but not necessarily for the reserve component. And that gap leaves the Nevada National Guard utilizing other dollars to implement the H2F. Uh, without additional manning or programming funding. Uh, so Sergeant Major, Major Grinston, I commend you on your leadership uh, thus far in implementing the H2F and listening to the reserve component on their needs. So my question is, can you elaborate on the steps that you're taking to ensure that not only is H2F implemented successfully, uh, but it's also funded fully within the reserve component? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, as we looked at the the holistic health and and, and fitness, that's what uh, when we look at the human optimization um, program, we have to make sure we do look at the total force, and that's why we've asked at the end of this uh, physical year, at the beginning of the next physical year in October, that the Army National Guard and the Army Reserves come back to us on what what they need uh, help from from the Department of the Army to implement their program. That's what we put in the executive order. So we have a few more months before they come back to the plan and say, here's how do we implement this? So as the active component, like I stated very quickly earlier, as we added an athletic trainer at a brigade, well, a brigade in the Army National Guard could be, you know, a couple states or an Army Reserve unit, a couple states. That's why we need help from the Army National Guard uh, or the National Guard Bureau to come back and see how they would implement that and then the way forward. So we have a plan uh, in October to to get the brief back and we'll have to see what help they will need in the future. Great. Yeah, listen, I think especially with respect to the specific um, uh, issues surrounding uh, reservists that even looking at tele, you know, tele commuting and uh, in, in doing some of our outreach that way would be beneficial as well. So look forward to hearing the results of that uh, analysis. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you. The, the town lady yields back. Um, we're going to start our uh, second round of questions. I, I put the order of questions of the members that are remaining in the chat and uh, I'll, I'll begin I'll begin with my uh, with, with my second round of questions. Um, I, I uh, would really like to focus on sexual assault. Um, in fiscal year 2020, the, the Army really continued to see a very high rate of sexual assault reports, 5.5 reports of sexual assault per 1,000 soldiers, which is unchanged from FY 18 and 19 and the highest reporting rate ever recorded. Of the 6,688 FY20 reports, 3,250 were from the Army, which is the highest of any service. And that's outrageous and unacceptable. Um, I mean, the Army has actually managed to leapfrog the Marines in having the worst record for sexual assault reports. Um, Sergeant Major Grinston, can, can you explain what actions the Army is taking to combat sexual assault and prevent retaliation? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the question. What are we doing uh, to prevent 
sexual assault. Uh, our, our, our biggest efforts are in uh, prevention of sexual assault and sexual harassment, where we need to ensure our leaders understand that this uh, type of behavior is not acceptable. And we have to pick leaders that are willing uh, and able to intervene in behalf of their soldiers all the way down to the individual soldier could be a leader in that. And so our biggest efforts will go in to picking the better leader. And I'll use the battalion commander's assessment program as we look to and implement the, it's already implemented the battalion commander's assessment program. There is a survey that they sent out and asked for what's the climate uh, for this individual in the past. And then that is used assessment to pick them as a leader. And Sergeant, as we- Sergeant Major, I was asking you specifically, what are you doing to prevent retaliation and combat sexual assault? If you could focus on how you're preventing retaliation and also how you're combating it. Yes, ma'am. Preventing retaliation. Um, I still, Madam Chair, I thank you for the question. And I still believe having a leader that is not going to retaliate against their soldiers is extremely important. If, if we can't pick a leader that does not at the battalion, brigade, sergeant, staff sergeant level, those leaders, um, if we don't get the right leadership, uh, then we're never going to actually get better with retaliation. Respectfully, you have leaders in place now who are retaliating. And so you're, you're, what you're talking about is how you prospectively choose leaders. I'm talking about the leaders that are now there now that are retaliating. What are you doing to make sure that the leaders that are there now who have not, uh, are not going to necessarily benefit from the program you're talking about? Are, going to, are, are, are ceasing retaliation or are ceasing to be in jobs that allow them to do that? Madam Chair, uh, again, thank you for that question and clarification. The Army does not tolerate retaliation. And those, when we find, have been retaliated against, uh, those have been investigated. And, and then we hold those leaders accountable if we uh, find that a soldier has been retaliated against that is not tolerated in the United States Army. Okay. There doesn't appear to be a lot of evidence of that. And I mean, so much so that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs has now dropped his opposition to taking prosecution authority away from commanders in sexual assault investigations because it doesn't appear that they are willing to change. Uh, Secretary Sirach, what, what's the Army doing to ensure installations are safe for all genders and making sure that you can actually do something to, ch to, to, to impact these horrendous numbers? Uh, uh, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. So it's about, you said safety, ma'am? It's about sexual assault in the military, safety for all genders and making sure that you can do something to actually move the needle on the numbers of sexual assaults in the Army? Um, that's, that's a little bit out of my portfolio, but I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll, you know, I'll try to comment on it, uh, ma'am. Um, so, um, you know, to the, to the extent there's anything with respect to facilities that has anything to do with this, with, uh, we, we are we're paying very close attention. Um, so, uh, for instance, in our new uh, barrack standards, I, I think we're going to be able to introduce some technology uh, with respect to, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, security and safety cameras and, and some things like that, that that could go a long way in the future, you know, once once that can be implemented. Uh, but anything else that we're aware of, we're, we're taking um, immediate action. Um, okay. It's clear that you have to take the answer to that question in detail for the record. So if you could do that so that we can get a clear and very specific understanding of what you're doing in the Army to make sure that your facilities are safe for all genders. And Sergeant Major, if you can get me a detailed answer on specifically, besides training better leaders, what you're doing about the leaders that are there now that are retaliating. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I yield back 
Um, I don't see uh, Judge Carter here, Mr. Bishop. Uh, no, forgive me, Mr. Uh, Mr. Valdeo, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Mr. Valdeo. Mm, okay, Mr. Rutherford, are you ready? I'm ready, Madam Chair. Okay, Thank you. you're recognized for five minutes. Yes, if I could, Sergeant Major, going back to the, uh, I, I want to follow up on uh, Congresswoman Lee's line of questioning concerning H2F. And, the, you know, in the concept paper, the point that I was trying to make earlier about readiness was the fact that uh, at that time they were saying 58,000 soldiers, which is a, a 13 uh, brigade combat teams, uh, were non-deployable. That was um, with 16,500 soldiers on temporary profile and another 15,000 on permanent profiles. And, uh, and, and apparently in the, in the rollout back in 2018, I guess it was, one of the indicators was that there were stovepipes of effort uh, at different installations dealing with the, the fitness uh, of, our, of our soldiers. And, and there was gonna be a move to try and put that under a brigade commander or so, someone I think it created, my understanding was some kind of unitary uh, chain of command for that effort. Uh, can you can you tell me what's happened on that since 2018? Congressman. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the holistic health and fitness now is under the training and doctrine commander, General Funk. So he is uh, responsible and accountable for the entire program for the total army. And so he's bringing all the human op performance optimizations programs under his command. So uh, that that command goes to General Funk and he's responsible to look at all the, whether that's uh, sleep, nutrition, exercise, all under his command of the training and doctrine command. But once it flows down from there, it's just the chain of command is responsible for holistic health and fitness. Okay, good, I, I, I didn't realize that, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, looking at the installation energy and water plans that, that are out there and the critical mission needs. I know uh, it was talked about, uh, the Army has about 30 of these uh, installation energy and water plans out there that are either at or near completion. Uh, and I know we're spending about a billion dollars a year, I think on the energy and water. Uh, so I, I wanna ask this question about where, where we are going forward. Uh, you know, there's, I see some talk about creating these island effects where the installation would be an island unto itself, own energy, own water, those sorts of things. But then on the other hand, I see where I think it was, uh, I forget the exact number, but but I believe it was 14 of 18 uh, systems that have been privatized. And so there, you know, which, which way are we moving on this? Uh, is it to build islands where, we, where we're self-sufficient or to outsource uh, through these privatized uh, contracts? Uh, Congressman, but, boy, that's a great, uh, great question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So, sir, the the installation energy and water plans is a is a is about a three plus year effort. Uh, we do have thirty that are are completed. Probably about another hundred to go. Uh, we expect to have them all done uh, by about September of 20, uh, 2022. The the um, you know overall, the Army is focused on on three things: resilience, efficiency, and affordability. With respect, with respect to energy, um, so so at the end of the day, I mean, I mean, we've got to have re resilience. We, you know, efficiency and affordability is about trying to bring down th that that billion dollar cost that that, that you know that that you mentioned, um, and we've 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 uh, done well with re with uh, reducing our consumption 
over the years. However, the bill keeps going up because the unit cost of energy, uh, you know, you know, keeps uh, increasing. So we need to we need to keep the press on there. We need to use all the tools that we possibly can. Let me come back to the, your island, uh, the island issue. So, so at the end of the day, what we're asking our senior commanders to do is 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 to is to uh, determine for their for the facilities that house critical mission what they need. Do they need one day, five days, ten days of of backup power? And so, in some cases, I think we will have uh, uh, an island. Um, in other cases, uh, uh, we'll, we will not, and we will have a building level uh, um, solution, a backup generator, sir. So, so the island concept is pretty much just a temporary situation you're talking about. Uh, I think we're going to, uh, it's not going to be a cookie cutter, sir. I think uh, a lot of the, a lot of our installations are different. It kind of depends the service territory they're in, uh, the, you know, uh, threats and, and those sorts of things. We definitely will end up with some that are, that are, that are islanded. And I, and I think going forward, some that are not, sir. Okay. Uh, I thank the panel for your uh, testimony here today. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay. Gentleman yields back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Bishop, do you have a uh, round of questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can ask five let minutes. me just follow up uh, with uh, the line of questions dealing with the environment. Um, I know that uh, Fort Benning solar farms have played an enormous role in our region's strategic development plan and energy resilience. And it's a good step uh, in addressing climate change, but we've got to do more. Um, Ten years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, launched the Engineering with Nature, uh, using natural processes and systems to deliver a broad range of economic, environmental, and social benefits. Uh, is the Army currently developing and implementing nature-based solutions in current infrastructure, engineering, and water projects? And how can we further use nature to solve our infrastructure crisis amid extreme weather and climate change? I understand that some of the uh, challenges that uh, our installations will be facing and the Army will be facing uh, probably need to be discussed in another setting. Uh, so I will uh, uh, defer going into that in any greater detail. But if you could touch on that uh, quickly, and I'd like to go to some quality of life. Uh, questions uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, what the Army has done recently to address uh, uh, the concerns of uh, quality health care, child care, spousal employment, uh, and uh, the possibility of food insecurity uh, within the lower ranks of uh, some of our NCOs, uh, particularly as they have tried to uh, uh, deal with uh, the SNAP program and some not being able to be found eligible. So if you would, uh, 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 deal with that, all of you, and I think uh, Sergeant Major Grinster might want to end up with the food insecurity uh, question. All right, sir, uh, Congressman, thank you. This is Mr. Suresh. I'll, I'll start first. Uh, so, yes, we are very interested in the engineering with nature uh, approach, um, and, and that is active. Typically, the Army uh, Civil Civil Works Program, um, you know, does that, uh, but what, it's something we're, you know, we're, we're very interested in. It, it, it definitely helps in, uh, you know, in, in, in places with respect to uh, you know, tidal activity and and uh, and things like that. You know, with respect to our our installations, um, uh, you know, frankly, in the army, the the long term threat appears to be desertification at the majority of our installations. We do still have some that will have have some water issues. A couple of our coastal uh, installations, um, but but uh, it appears to be uh, a very different uh, makeup than, for instance, the navy with all their waterfront property. Uh, Ms. And Congressman, thank you for uh, the questions. I'll just touch on uh, two of uh, the quality of life topics. Uh, and uh, if there's other questions you'd like to, to add. The first is the food insecurities. Um, we would ask the, the committee and, and everyone if there's a way for uh, to get federal support for Congress uh, so that they would not include the basic allowance of housing as income that would actually help our soldiers um, as they look um, to get that not counted for the family uh, substance, um, because when that's counted, it gives them a higher rating of what's their basic allowance, and then therefore they're not available for those subsidies. 
but we do have the family substance supplemental allowance program and that is available to our soldiers if they're having those food insecurities and we also have the army emergency relief fund but uh, we could do from um, with some federal support on the second one for spouse employment uh, we have increased our li state license uh, as a spouse would move from uh, one state to the next state we would say if you want to get a new license the army uh, previously would reimburse five hundred dollars we've increased that to one thousand dollars as you move from one location to the next location if you want to get re-licensed um, as you move but again i would ask for help from the committee as they move from state to state for state reciprocity so that we would just validate the license if we have a behavioral health specialist that moved from Washington State to Kentucky to honor those licenses as they move from state to state. That's where we could use some assistance. General Evans? Sir, I'll, I'll tackle the next two child care and uh, health care. Uh, child care, um, in increasing the capacity there for the Army, it's a multi pronged strategy. It, it, it focuses on not just building more CDCs, but how do we retain staff and incentivize staff? Uh, garrison commanders have direct hire authority. They've created the civilian employment assistant tool, which allows uh, non-appropriated fund direct care staff to, if they're moving from one installation to another, to, uh, to seamlessly move to that installation without having to go through the, the processing all over again. Um, we also, the, the garrison commanders inside the pay ban for non-appropriated fund employees, they can, they, they can, um, give, they can raise or increase the, the salary for those employees up to $25 an hour. So generally they stay within the national average uh, in the community of $10 an hour. It also, um, we have fee assistance uh, off post when, you know, we have long wait lines in, in certain regions. And so we have Army fee assistance off post, and we had about 10,000 uh, people take uh, advantage of that. We currently have family child care in the home. We have about 151 of those, um, which provides about 490 spaces. Um, and so we're trying to increase that to 251. Uh, DOD last year implemented a, a policy that created the, that, uh, that um, put uh, military families at the priority at priority one which created an, another four or 500 spaces for family members. Um, and uh, we also have a, a robust restoration modernization program to, to keep spaces open. Um, so um, thank you for the question. It, it, it is an ongoing problem um, to, for us. Um, we also in the, uh, over the 10 year plan, um, we plan to build uh, 10, uh, 21 uh, CDCs to include the three that that uh, you authorized or committee authorized uh, early last year, which is two in Hawaii, which is a high uh, wait list area uh, along with Alaska. For healthcare, uh, uh, yes, sir. I think my time has expired, but uh, I, I, I understand you might view it as a, as a problem or a challenge, but let's view it as an opportunity. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, the gentleman yields back, but I, I do want to point out that uh, the li licensure and some of the issues you've just been talking about are, are authorizing issues. So you definitely should, uh, I would advise you, um, our friends in the Army, to, to bring that up with the, with the HAS committee. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, Mr. Judge Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two, two areas. First, Sergeant Major, you said the Army does not tol uh, tolerate failure to respond to sexual assault. Uh, what is the what is the consequence? Do you lose? Do you get kicked out of the Army? What is the consequence? Reducing rank. It's got to be a consequence somewhere. Uh, Representative Carter, I believe I heard the question is, what are the consequences to sexual assault? Correct. 
Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the question. There is no one answer for the response and it would never be prudent to say this is the uh, answer to every case. Um, there are multiple things that can be done and sexual assault depends on the case. Um, some of those cases are abusive sexual contact, meaning if I do something, uh, touch one of those body parts, and that could be anywhere from court martial uh, to administrative uh, actions. And there is no. My question is in the chain of command, failure of the chain of command to respond to sexual assault, you said it's not tolerated. Yes, so in the chain of command, there's some issue with a commander who doesn't implement the sexual assault prevention program that the Army has designed or, or doesn't do it. What are the consequences to that commander? Yes, sir. NCO or, or, sir. Yes, sir. Uh there still is no exact same answer, but uh, I would just refer to the actions taken by the Secretary of the Army in December after the Fort Hood Independent Review. There were at that time 14 uh, individuals that were either suspended or relieved from their positions. Uh, and then there was another ongoing investigation uh, that, that finds if there was criminal activities in those actions. So leaders are held accountable and uh, I think the final verdict was 21 uh, folks either removed from position or suspended uh, from their duties uh, pending uh, further investigation. Thank you. I think that was the answer that the chairman was looking for. Uh, the other question I have is on the issue of, of training to meet our new fiscal program that we, we came up with. I know the Army did a lot of studies to build more strength in our, in our Army. Now, if, a, if an individual soldier is failing that test consistently, does the Army have a series of exercise plans for the individual soldier to work on to where they can meet the requirements of each test? And is it also in any way designed for women soldiers who because of their body mass makeup would have to do different work than maybe a, a, a male soldier would have to do. Are you doing anything in those areas? Uh, Representative Carter, thank you for the question. Um, yes, we have over 6,000 master fitness trainers in the Army. Uh, across the, the total army and they are designed and their job is to and can develop an individual training plan for each individual and that's why it, it goes back to the holistic health and fitness and that's just the master fitness trainers that we have that we trained in the army that are green suitors that's not including the athletic coaches that we've added and the strength and conditioning uh facilitators course that we've added to the Army since then. So the answer is yes, that we can do and have done and will do and continue to do uh, individual plans for those that are struggling to pass the Army Combat Fitness Test. Thank you, that's that's exactly what I need. How are you back, Madam Chairman? And I'm gonna have to get off now. Thank you, okay. no problem. We're gonna wrap up in a moment. Okay, bye. Yeah. Valadeo, take care. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, you're back. Um, Mr. Valadeo, you're recognized for your five minutes of questions. I appreciate that. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, what the Army is doing department-wide to provide on-base activities and programs for our younger single service members. I've heard many anecdotal stories about younger service members at less favorable uh, bases getting into more trouble with drugs and alcohol simply because they get bored or have little to do with uh, surrounding the com uh, in the surrounding community. This issue has been compounded uh, by the intense COVID-19 restrictions that kept many younger service members confined to their rooms. You feel that there are adequate recreation facility activities, activity facilities on your bases. And this one's towards uh, Master Sergeant Grinston, sorry. 
Congressman, uh, thank Congressman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, we have several programs uh, throughout the Army. I will just name uh, two to three very quickly uh, for what we do for our soldiers throughout installations. First is the Better Opportunity for Single Soldiers, and that is a program that where single soldiers uh, at in any installation can get together and and go out and have activities. It's not about just having fun, but if there's also classes that they can attend at the University of Kansas when I was at Fort Riley. We sent them there to do some life skills training. Um, so that's one of the programs that we run uh, out of the Better Opportunity for Single Soldiers, and that is Army-wide program. The second one is the Warrior Adventure Quest. Is So uh, when I use this mostly as I would return from combat, we bring those soldiers back and you can go and do activities as a group, not just as single soldiers, but as a squad or platoon. You could go funded through the family uh, morale and recreation uh, facilities. You can go on group bike rides, snow skiing, um, um, scuba diving, and those programs are exist. And has that been um, impacted by COVID? Absolutely. Um, if we can't all get together, it's really hard to do any of those programs um, as we look forward. But we also do, a lot of locations do have um, um, like warrior zone centers where we have gaming. Um, again, um, on one installation, you have um, a place to eat. There's actually a movie type theater uh, in the room. We have video games, big gaming centers. So it's all in one building location. And it's not at every location in the Army, but those are just a few of the programs we have to get the soldiers yeah, uh, active. I appreciate the response. I mean, the main goal was to make sure you knew that that's something that, at least myself, I don't know if others on this committee, but are important because these uh, these younger enlisted need activities to stay busy and stay out of trouble and stay focused on, uh, on serving our country. So I appreciate that. The next one, uh, change up a little bit, and this one's towards uh, uh, General Evan. Um, Many military spouses believe that the military lifestyle, including frequent moves, deployments, and long hours that keep service members from assisting with parenting and living uh, in areas with poor local labor market conditions has negatively affected their employment opportunities. I'm glad to see that the Army has prioritized addressing this concern for our military families. What programs have been working and what can Congress do to help ensure our military spouses remain competitive in the civilian job market? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. So as alluded to before, um, is is um, the licensing. And so what we've done is for licensing certifications, we've assisted spouses with uh, up to $1,000 uh, reimbursing for the expense of doing that. Um, the Army Emergency Relief will also um, help reimburse for that expense up to $2,500. What, what we really, um, we're working with the defense uh, liaison at Department of Defense to get the, the reciprocity from state to state. That is that is really key. Um, we're also working with the civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army in that endeavor to, to get states on to recognize the, 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 the reciprocity of the licenses and certification for spouses. Uh, and that one that's a really a, a big one for us, sir. Okay, and so if there's something that we need to do on the legislative front to make that or help that situation a little bit, by all means, let this committee know. So. Um, I appreciate that, and uh, Chairwoman, I appreciate the, this last round, so thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Valadeo. The gentleman yields back. Um, before we wrap up, I, I, I just want to add that I, I, I found some of the answers to our questions um, particularly wanting. Um, I, I really didn't get the sense from the our friends who are really appreciated for their service um, that came before us from the Army today. Um, the lack of alarm about their place in terms of sexual assault in the military, retaliation, uh, the fact that they've surpassed even the Marines in the, in the amount of sexual assault, that the numbers are going in the wrong direction. I, I find their lack of alarm disturbing. Um, and, and, the, and the fact that there really weren't uh, Answer. I, I, we we had a uh, a meeting in advance of this hearing. 
Um, I certainly tele telegraphed that we'd be talking about these kinds of quality of life issues. That's the purpose of these hearings. And so I, I hope that the answers for the record that come back are far more de detailed and reflect uh, the alarm that clearly has been presented by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so much so that he has dropped his longtime opposition to going outside the chamber, chain of command for prosecution because it appears that everything that has been tried so far has not worked. And it must be safe for everyone who serves in the United States military and particularly in the United States Army. I, I would also add that I would strongly suggest that you go back and take a look at what happened with the way this new test was implemented. Certainly there's no woman that enters the military that I would think would want to have ex different or lower expectations of them, but the test shouldn't be structured in a way that is unfair and makes it so lopsided that it's impossible for women to really be able to succeed. And that definitely will reflect, will reflect in your recruitment and retention efforts. So it, it looks like you have a problem and I hope you recognize that and give us some answers for the record as to what you plan to do about that. So that, that concludes this afternoon's hearing. Um, I do, before we wrap up members, and I wish more members were here uh, for me to recognize this individual. We have a, a member of our staff who has served capably in the Appropriations Committee uh, staff for both the majority and the minority for 20 years as an, appro as, as an appropriation staff member, 24 years of service to the United States Congress. That's Sarah Young, who uh, has done a remarkable job and has provided expertise to countless leaders, uh, Mr. Bishop and myself included. And, uh, and we, she's retiring in, at the end of August, and we want to thank her really for her service. We won't have as much of an opportunity in a markup to do that, so I wanted to make sure that we did that in this subcommittee because she served us so incredibly capably. So I don't believe that Sarah is, uh, is oh yeah, there she is. Sarah, turn your camera on. I'm here. <laughs> Right, Tommy, you thank you. <laughs> turn your camera on if you can so that we can thank I you. Can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your incredible service. And uh, with that. Definitely was, not, definitely was not expecting that, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you to our witnesses for, our, for participating in today's hearing. Your updates and perspectives will be helpful to us. <laughs> you got an applause from Mr. Rutherford um, as we develop the FY22 appropriations bill. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.